Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Joe Emilio Show. Yes, I have a different background. I'm in Joburg at the moment, uh, and I won't reveal where I am, but all you need to know is I'm in Joburg. I got sorted to bring you this show. I'm very excited to have my guest on, but before I get to my guest, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to check out Rebel Store ZA. Dot com. All right, you can get yourself some pretty cool uh, shirts over there and become a member to my channel, not on YouTube. Go in the description below on my website. You can become a member. And if you're a member for at least six months, you get a rebel hat and not the rebel hat that you see there. I mean, any hat. And we just added this to our uh, to our merch. So, yeah, if you think this is pretty cool, you can get that on the rebel store or you can become a member for six months and you can choose to have that hat and wear it and show how much you love the ANC. Um, and then don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to also like this video, please share it. And if you're new to my channel, please subscribe. And like I just said, there are other ways that you can donate to this channel. If you enjoy the content on this channel, please check it out. And if there is a question tonight that you really want to ask my guest, please use the Super Chat function. Not only does the Super Chat help, again, donate to the show, uh, it highlights the comment or question, and therefore, by YouTube law, I have to address it. There's just no getting around that. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, use that function. Now, having said all that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm super excited. I am blown away that she said yes to come onto the show, uh, and it's greatly appreciated. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the woman you've all come to see, the one, the only, Natasha Mazon. <laughs> Hey. Hey, Joe. I want one of those hats now. <laughs> like, I want to wear that hat tomorrow in Parliament. I was wondering if you were gonna if you were gonna like this. Like, I wasn't I, sure. I love that, and uh, it will go very well with my uh, sick uh, perfume that I yes. bought from, uh, from the Kiffness. So yes, I'm testing yes. these uh, foot sack products. I'm loving them. Fantastic. Uh, do you have Ronaldo's sex shirt? Because then you need, you need to complete the... I, I don't yet, but I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I've got to collect all of these things. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll let you in on a little secret before we start. I'm a real yeah. Bulgarian. So it's very hard for me at times to keep my uh, fish mouth uh, closed and, and act like a grown up. So uh, it was a great pleasure of mine uh, at the end of last year to to end my speech by saying uh, foot sack to 2020 in Parliament and yes. not being out of order. <laughs> no, but I think, you know what, even though, and we've discussed this before, you know, when we were chatting uh, privately and I asked you to come into the show, I mentioned that not a lot of people like you, but... Funny enough, when I announced the show, a lot of people messaged me like privately and said, oh my word, I love this woman. I cannot wait to see the show. And like, I'm a fan of you. I think what you do is amazing. The the interview, I say interview, uh, more like a, a ENCA did a thing with you uh, last year when you were taking the EFF to court for incitement of, uh, of for hate speech. Yeah. And uh, you were on, uh, I, I can't remember who the guy was that, that they got from EFF that was, you know, the EFF are all the same, really. And uh, I, I, I loved what you said. And, and you call them out. You call everyone out on the BS. And please feel free to be yourself on this channel. I deeply encourage it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, look, um, I'm an open book and not everyone is going to like me. And that is absolutely okay. I, I don't like everyone myself, so I, I don't expect everyone to like me. I have a, a very specific and very strong brand of politics, and mm. I don't expect everyone to like that. But yeah. um, I'm, I'm not there for everyone to like. I'm a, a staunch fighter, and I, I believe in everyone having their right to have uh, their say. And, I, and even mm. if I disagree with you, I'll have you have your right to say it. But I, I draw the line at fascism. And uh, yeah. I, I absolutely, I mean, it's no, it's no secret. I despise everything that the EFF stand for. And um, let me tell you, uh, all six foot 101 kilos of me stand against uh, fascists every day in Parliament. And the only good thing to come from COVID is that I don't have to see them in person in the House. 
I, I get to watch them on screen and, and thoroughly enjoy having them muted occasionally. Um, but that, that's the only good thing that COVID has given to me, I'll tell you that much. I agree. Um, I think for the first time we saw in Parliament the past few weeks, you know, with Sona and the Sona debate, it actually ran smoothly, somewhat. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you know this, like, I don't know if you guys could hear. I and mean, I don't know if you saw my video that I did the day of Sona. But I did a short clip and on air through ENCA, I don't know if uh, SABC had audio problems as well, but ENCA was having audio problems and we heard someone burp. Yeah. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> I, I thought it was a fart. So you, you, you're, you're clearing it up for me. So burp, fart. I can tell you that we've had people um, walk into the toilet and accidentally activate the video on their Zoom and then um, sort of the whole of parliament scream, your video is on as the zip was going down and then the video got turned off. Um, there has been Nipplegate, no. um, the Nipplegate no. parliament, a parliamentary official was uh, lying in bed, very relaxed during a portfolio committee meeting and turned on his camera accidentally and um, he, he didn't have his shirt on. And so we've had the Nipplegate scandal. My, my personal favorite was, and I don't blame her, I would have done the same thing, incredibly tedious rules committee meeting. One of the officials just accidentally turned on her camera and lit a cigarette and sort of put her feet up on the desk and had a smoke. You know, Politeness stops me doing that, you know, myself, but, you know, I couldn't blame her. But um, Zoom has introduced an entire new world to us, and uh, it has proved how careful you have to be with technology because it can be a blessing, wow. but my, oh, my, can it cause trouble when, uh, when it goes wrong? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you something, which I don't tell a lot of people, but, I mean, we, this is a no-holds-barred show, right? So yeah. about two years ago, I was doing a, a, a leadership course and uh, I was phoned about the appointment of the ESCOM board. And mm -hmm. this leadership course was at a hotel and they phoned us at about six o'clock in the evening. It was about 42 degrees. We were in the Northwest province and we'd all been in the swimming pool. So I rushed back to my hotel room uh, to do the, the Skype interview. And you know what hotel rooms are like? You've got one chair and a bed. So all your clothes yeah. get thrown over the chair. And it took uh, Twitter exactly 10 seconds to figure out that there was a bra hanging on the back of the chair right behind me. And for about six weeks on Twitter, my underwear was discussed at great length. So, you know, these kind of mishaps are just, you know, they, they're human in nature, but I've now learned to very carefully check the background behind me and to make sure there's nothing that uh, should not be seen uh, in, yeah. in, well, in the background behind me. So these things do happen. Well, at least you didn't take a selfie in the bathroom like some girls do, you know, that we yeah. see on, on social media. <laughs> at least that, I mean, there's been some terrible mishaps. Uh, very quickly, uh, Yanni Vanderfalt giving a 70 Rand super chat. Thank you so much, Yanni, saying, Joe, Natasha's hashtag, hashtag FootSec NC Cap will be proudly sponsored by the Vanderfalts. Five minutes in, we like her. <laughs> Oh, bless you. Bless you. Awesome. I can't take it, though, because it's a gift, and I, I, a, a good member of parliament doesn't accept gifts, so you wear that cap for me. I'll buy my own one, and then we'll both have, Yanni, and then we can both proudly wear our Futsak ANC caps. Fantastic. I like that. Um, all right. So things I want to really ask you, all right? Yeah. Um, I think I found out something interesting about you, which I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, you are a fan of music. Yes, <laughs> a big fan of music. Yeah. Um, uh, I was, um, so I'm, I'm sure you can tell I'm, I'm very shy and um, I hate the camera, you know. Shy, yeah. yeah, I hate, hate a microphone, hate any attention. Um, and growing up, uh, I, you know, it's also very well known that I, I come from an Italian family and uh, all Italians sing, and I happen to have a father who's got the most majestic voice and a brother who's a lot older than me who also is majestic. And um, I went and I, I tried out for an opera school and I got in. And uh, for about six weeks, my family was calling me uh, Kiri Tikanoa, you know, the great hope of the, the family. And uh, my music teacher um, 
bless her, was very honest. She said to me, look, you, you definitely have a talent, but you're not good enough to be the prima soprano. So, you know, you must decide, is the, is the background, is the chorus good enough? Or mm. do you crave that spotlight? And I have, a, I have a really good self-awareness. I know what my strong points are and I know what my weak points are. And one of my strong points is I, I do like to be the center of attention. So um, if I wasn't going to be the best at it, uh, I wasn't going to continue with it. So I decided mm. that um, the operatic voice would be kept for family occasions. And uh, there's nothing I enjoy better than a, a little sing-along at a family birthday or uh, as happens in our family when we have a big Italian family lunch. Uh, my dad normally starts off a, a Neapolitan song because my family comes from Naples in Italy and uh, everyone mm. joins in. But uh, yeah, absolutely love music. And um, if only I was good enough, uh, who knows, I, I would have been on the stage, but I wasn't good enough. So uh, you know what they say about politicians, it's a theater for ugly people. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I was about to ask, like, so how did you go from being someone, I mean, opera alone is not a very popular choice for most people who are into music. Um, I've listened to it occasionally. I love classical music and, and stuff like that. Uh, but how, how did you fall into politics then? Well, Joe, you know, life life deals you some interesting cards. And um, growing up as the child of immigrant parents, I spent a lot of time in my parents' home, which is Italy. And I would see the news that uh, South Africans didn't see. So, for example, uh, you know, I was born in 1979. So uh, the, the riots had happened already. And um, sort of about 1986, I was in Italy with, with my family. And um, the state of emergency happened. And I remember my dad phoning my aunt in Italy to tell her that I'd have to extend my stay because um, they weren't sure if it was safe for me to come home. And I saw on TV, uh, on the Italian TV, what was really happening. And when I came home, um, my brother and sister, who are both, uh, they are 10 and 12 years older than me, respectively, that they were politically active in those days in the PFP, and I would listen to them talking. Nice. And... Um, you know, I, I saw the real, re, you know, it wasn't censored what I saw. I saw what was really happening. And I, I would ask my father, you know, what's going on? What's happening? Why, why is this happening? And um, I remember a lot of uh, European kids being sent to Europe uh, in sort of 1994 when uh, the swearing in of Madiba happened because people were so worried that there would be a civil war and things like that. And my dad said to me, we're going to union buildings and we're going to witness history. And wouldn't you know, it happened on my birthday, the 9th of May. Wow. And um, so elections always happen uh, on the 9th or the 10th of May, which for me is, is, is very, it's very telling. But mm -hmm. I've always been a good speaker. Um, I, I've always been, I like to lead. I don't think uh, the kids in my class always um, appreciated that very much because in my class, there was never a vote for class captain. I, I was just the class captain. And um, politics has, has been a fascination of mine. Uh, my mom uh, follows an Eastern philosophy and uh, I grew up as a, as a Buddhist. And I strongly believe that we have to be the change we wanna see. And I know that sounds so corny, but I, I really do believe it. And the way I could make a change and where I saw myself making a difference uh, was in politics. And when I, when I got to varsity, um, and yes, let's get it out of the way, I did not get my degree. I am the second most famous matriculant in South Africa. I'm a university dropout. I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. But when I got to varsity, the constitution had just been passed and it was the most amazing document. And the whole world was looking at us, congratulating us on our constitution. And I became obsessed with learning everything I could about the constitution. And that naturally led me into, into the field of politics. And at the time, the DP youth um, was going through a bit of a slump. And I had the opportunity to start the DP youth at the, on the tax campus. And uh, that's what I did. And... Um, I, I adored Tony Leon and I was mm. in sort of so in awe of people like Douglas Gibson and Dean Smuts. And, uh, you know, these were people that, that for me growing up were heroic. And, yeah. uh, you know, to think that I sit in the same seats at them, it's, it still blows me away. Okay. Well, that 
that's actually awesome. You, in a way, followed or fell into something that you found out you have a lot of passion about, and you pursued it. Um, I do want to push back a bit on something you said uh, that you are not proud that you didn't uh, that you're a high school dropout, basically. And I want to push back on that. I'm a high school dropout. I'm a varsity dropout. I finished oh, varsity school. Dropout, I sorry. didn't finish varsity. Sorry. Sorry, if it didn't finish uh, varsity, so you have a matric basically, um, yeah. and I think I think that's nothing to be ashamed about. Um, I mean, you know, you can continue your studies at any point in your life, um, and anybody who is able to work hard and uh, grow the ladder, so to speak, in whatever industry that might be, uh, deserves a huge pat on the back. I mean, not everybody can. I mean, for different reasons, no, some people can't get. A varsity degree or, or a diploma or whatever the case you know finances uh you know there's a lot of different reasons um you know my mom for example she doesn't even have uh, a high school uh thing uh she didn't finish high school because she had to take care of her younger brother uh yeah. her mom got really sick or my grandmother got really sick and she had to take care of her younger brother but she still was able to fly Emirates uh, back in the day and er, and work her way up in that industry and was very successful as an air hostess. Um, yeah, you don't need a degree to become one, but still, she worked her way up. She became uh, well known in that industry, and, and that's fine. Uh, so that's why I say, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be embarrassed about it. I'd, I'd wear it with pride because I think, I mean, I've looked at your uh, career very briefly. You've you've grown exponentially, I would say. You know, um, well, I, which reminds. I, I tell you, I tell you why I'm embarrassed. It's yeah. the degree means nothing, and okay. and I know, I know many people who have many degrees who I don't rate at all, and I know people yes. who've been to the University of Life who I rate incredibly highly. Mm -hmm. What I'm embarrassed about is that I wasted my parents' money, and my parents worked exceptionally hard, and every hour God gave them. To, to ensure that I could go to university. And that I'm ashamed about. I'm ashamed that I wasted their, their hard earned money. But I, okay. I have made my dad a promise. I will mm. get a degree. And um, I'm, the thing is I studied law because it was the, it was the obvious thing to do, you know, to go mm. into politics. And um, I'm by no stretch of the imagination an academic. I'm, I'm not one of those people that sits down and, and reads a textbook easily. It, it's you know, for me, I, I would rather live the experience than read it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that I owe it to my parents yes. and I owe them an apology for, mm -hmm. for wasting their money. And I know that I make my parents proud, but they make me so proud. So that's, that's you know, the, the, the degree, it's not the degree that I'm, I'm irritated with. I'm, I'm irritated with the fact that I was, I was young and silly and, and I had everything given to me on a, on a silver platter. And, and I I feel like I've let them down. And I think that I need to make amends for letting them down because they worked so hard to pay for my university, which I, I didn't complete. Well, that's a that's a very fair point. In, in, in that regard, yes, I, I would agree with you on that. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, you're, like you said, your parents are, are super proud of you. I just want to address quickly, uh, like I said, I have to address these. Uh, Chris White giving a $5 so now I can pay my rent at the end of the month. Thank you so much for the dollars, Chris. Um, she comes across in public appearances as a regular Joe jo or Jane. Uh, reminds me a bit of Chris uh, Howard Smith in Namibia. Any comment on that? Look, um, it's uh, I, I, you know like I get called Rottweiler, Barbie, um, Barbie. But yes, I, I, so you know, it's, it's I, I used to have very long blonde hair, and amazingly enough, um, this uh, electric white hair that you see is not natural. Um, <laughs> in case you didn't know, um, my, my my natural hair color, Joe, is uh, pretty much like yours. Um, oh, so yeah. when I when I uh, bleached it uh, blonde, I immediately got the the nickname of Parliament Barbie, which. Uh, in retrospect, is pretty cool considering how much uh, uh, power Barbie has. Um, pity I don't have the measurements, but hey, you can't win them all. But uh, I got the, right. the title Rottweiler too. Um, okay. So you know, the thing is, I I am a regular a regular Jane. You know, uh, mm. um, I lead a, a very 
pretty normal life. Um, I, I have friends who I, you know, just like you, nothing makes me happier than hanging out with my friends. Uh, COVID freaked me out completely because uh, I'm a sociable person and I'm a, I'm a very affectionate person. So mm. I, it's, to me, it's 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 abnormal not to give a you know the double kiss when I when I see someone. So mm. um, this whole COVID distancing thing is it's really taking taking its toll on me because I, I I need human interaction. Um, mm. But I, I really there's there's a it's an interesting thing in politics because there's a, a public persona. And then there's a, a private persona, and I get why a lot of people would not like me because of of the Rottweiler attitude that they might see on TV. And I get that sometimes I come across as a little bit arrogant, and um, you know, but you must remember that also being a woman in politics, like I get called aggressive, but if I was a man, I would be called assertive, and I get called bossy. Uh, but if I was a man, I would be told I was a good leader. So there's a there's a dynamic that's that's at play that we must never forget. That's a gender dynamic, and I I don't believe in I believe in meritocracy. So I believe in getting your position based never on your gender or your race. I believe that you get your position based on your ability, and I like to think that I've, I've got my position based on my ability. But um, the, the the persona that you see uh, on, on TV sometimes has to be overly aggressive because I work in a very aggressive environment and I have dealt with very aggressive people. And if you don't show a, a level of aggression back, um, there's, a, there's a power play that, that, that exists in politics. So, I, I mean, if you just see me, you know, normally in the streets, uh, the one thing I hate is being called Mrs. Mazzoni. Um, that's my mom. I, I much prefer people to call me Natasha and preferably Tasha because that's that's what I'm known known as. And um, I've finally got people in Parliament to start calling me Tasha because this honourable member is just to me the most bizarre thing yeah. on earth. And I, I don't, I, you know, in the house I, I sort of understand when we refer to each other as honourable members, but walking down a corridor when someone who in every which way is my senior turns around and, and says, hello, honorable member, I want to die a thousand deaths. And, you know, I then just say, please, my, my name is Tasha and I, you know, I bow to your, you know, your honorability. So it's it's just an interesting dynamic that exists in the world. And But I am, you know, in, in many respects, I am quite a plain normal Jane, actually. Mm, yeah. I, I think as well, um, I look, I think people... Like you said, they call you the Rottweiler and stuff like that. But you're also known as um, Chief Whip. Is that a yeah. real title in the DA? That's, like, is that that is, that is a real title? That is a constitutionally mandated title, and I'll tell you why. We follow the Westminster system of government, and okay. uh, back in the day, the the Chief Whip would literally carry a whip. And your job is to hold the party line. And when your members became out of order, you would crack the whip. And um, the so okay, I the, didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. So the the majority party has a, a chief whip, and the official opposition has a chief whip, and all other parties have senior whips. So just the uh, the ANC and the DA have the title chief whip, and it's a, a constitutionally mandated position. And I have a deputy chief whip, and then I have 13 whips that work with me. And um, our job is to, to sort of keep members in line. It's it's like a bizarre term, uh, but yeah, um, you'll, you'll you'll excuse me, sorry, you'll excuse me for laughing. I mean, I I grew up with the American system. We don't have chief whips, and anybody who would have just tuned in right now would have been like 13 whips behind me. <laughs> it's like I what know, did I, I do? Like, it sounds it sounds a bit like. Um, <laughs> but kinky, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> but when you know, now that you talk about the American system, like I can't, I can't hold back. Like my favorite American politician is Nancy Pelosi. Like um, one day when I have the guts to stand behind the president and tear up his nation's speech in front of TV, I mean that woman deserves such an award. 
And um, so, like, if anyone compared me to anyone, the greatest compliment they could give me is to is to say she's she's a bit like any which way, like Nancy Pelosi. I would, I would take that badge with such honor. I can't even begin to tell you. I would strongly suggest you don't. But okay, um, I'm not a fan of Nancy. I'm not a fan of Nancy Pelosi. I think what she did was disrespectful. No matter how much you hate Trump, uh, you know that was a speech, a president's speech, regardless. Yeah. I mean, nobody would have. I mean, had she done that with Obama, had she done that with any other uh, president, or even now uh, Biden, uh, you know, it, it would have been unacceptable. But because it was Trump, yeah. everybody praised her, which I think is just wrong. Uh, it's a no, president's no. speech. You don't do that. Um, but that's people my opinion. Say, um, people yeah. often say that, why don't we stand for the president? Uh, so it's a, we've got that dynamic in this country too, Joe, because uh, yeah. the opposition doesn't give the president a standing ovation. But what we do do is when the uh, procession arrives in Parliament, we stand. So we respect the office, but yes. uh, we, we don't necessarily stand for the president. So I fully get where you're coming from. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we th that's the I great think. thing about the world is that we're all entitled to, to, to our opinion. And that's yes. awesome. But let me, let me say this, though. I think you would be far better than Nancy Pelosi if you were in the American system. I think uh, you are... Uh, I, I like what you do here. You call mm -hmm. out, like I said, you call out the bleep BS. Chief Whip is like perfect. Like, I, I honestly thought it was a nickname, like like a wrestling name. You know, you get like uh, John the rough Roughinator, whatever, you know, like I thought that's what it was. I didn't know it was an actual thing, but I think you fit the role perfectly. And I think you do a good job or a great job rather of, of doing that. And you, you really, I think, got a lot of support when you were on the ground uh, during that protest, uh, speaking of which, I believe Clay Wilson is in the uh, chats at the moment watching and has been uh, praising you uh, the whole time. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but last year, uh, the police water cannoned a few protesters who were doing nothing wrong. Uh, they were protesting peacefully in the streets yeah. of uh, Cape Town. And I believe uh, the uh, what's it called? Uh, one of the coffee shops in in, in town. Truth yes, coffee shop. Truth coffee. Yes, got got destroyed almost. Yeah. I was. I have. You know. I have never been so angry. And that I think was the first time South Africa heard me swear, because I had no idea that cameras were were following me. Because I I literally ran from my office down the street to find the water cannons to stop the water cannons. And as I was running down, I was like, you know, what the F is going on? You know, this this, this can't, in, in, in modern day South Africa, this cannot be happening. Mm -hmm. And I got to Truth Coffee Shop just as they started spraying. And it was, it was so aggressive and so unnecessary. And it was just malicious bullying. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's amazing how when you stand up to a bully, how quickly they stand down. And when I found that officer who was on duty, I mean, I literally, I went, I went face to face with him. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a rules kind of person. I, I, I like, you know, in, in parliament, uh, the rules fascinate me. And I think that mm -hmm. things work better when we obey the rules, but mm -hmm. rules have to be logical and rules have to be sustainable and they have to be there for a reason. And when the police, break the rules and use a disaster management act the way they did. And they, they literally manipulate the rule to make them feel like um, the big guy on the street and, and to make the public feel scared. It upsets me. Like I, I cannot tell you. And that day being on the street with, with South Africans, I, 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 I felt an anger in me that I, I haven't felt for a long time. And I, I said to the policeman, if you're that brave, arrest me because I yes. would have loved to have seen a policeman try and wrestle me down, put me in cuffs and put me in the back of the van. And the next thing, the, the greatest story of that day was the police vehicle with a cannon on top kept trying to drive into the police station. And every time they pulled into the driveway, they smashed a side of the car because they were literally like running away from the cameras to get to hide the, the the cannon vehicle and by the time that car got into the parking lot it was completely smashed up so it was mm. instant karma for the police who had sprayed those crowds yeah that's true that's very true uh very quickly again two dollars uh wanted to pass tash my contact but pelosi ah. 
Chris, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Lucy. I like a lot of people. Chris, come back. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, Chris White's actually a, an American YouTuber who talks a lot about South African politics. Uh, yeah, I recommend you go on his show. He's, he's a very yeah. interesting guy. He, he was in the military uh, for, for okay. a very long time and worked uh, in Africa for a lot of his military career. Very interesting guy. Um, thank you, Chris, for watching. And thanks again for the super chats. Very quickly as well. I want to uh, let's let's be honest here. I you know what? I've, I've been doing on this channel a lot of uh, what I call on the ground. Uh, I wouldn't call it journalism because I don't, I don't necessarily report, but I go to the protests mm -hmm. and I live stream it. So it's mm -hmm. documented, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and people can see for themselves what really happened. Because we all know the mainstream media at the moment is very good at twisting and, and yeah. click baiting and all that stuff. So I don't know if it happened for the protests that you spoke of now. But it happens a lot when uh, police use water cannons and then immediately someone will come out and say, yeah, well, you know, they do it all the time to the black people. Or, you know, if there wasn't a protest where water cannons weren't used, uh, then they'll be like, you see, white people can protest whatever they want to. And they're, they're a lot rougher on the black people, blah, blah, blah. How do you feel about that commentary, that narrative that's going around at the moment? Well, you know, Joe, we have to be honest in this country, like, um, white people need to start protesting a little bit more because a, a lot of protests in South Africa are, are not done by white people. The protesting happens by, by black people. And, you know, we, we do have um, substantially more black people in South Africa than white people. And, you know, I, I think white people have had a, a great deal of apathy um, in, in protesting. And the protesting has been done in, like, very strange ways, like... Um, they'll stand at the robots and wave, you know, wave placards, but don't actually get onto the streets and take to the streets and, and march down the streets and, um, mm -hmm. you know, sing songs and, and, you know, really, you know, have like a, not a, well, like a war cry, you know, almost like yeah, a, yeah. a chant. Um, and, and black South Africans um, naturally, it's, you know, it's, it's a, when, when black people protest, they do a toy toy, you know, and it's, it's a dance yeah. and it's a, a lot of songs are sung. And um, uh, I find that in this country, white people are, they, they, the apathy is, is there. And I think that, that what we've, what we've seen is, is um, in COVID, uh, we, we did see suddenly white people appearing in protests, which we're, we're just not used to in South Africa. And uh, I'm a I'm a great believer in protests, and I, I love a good protest, and I love a, I love a good march. Um, so I, so you will see me at a lot of protests and a lot of marches. But I, I think that it's just something that um, isn't really you know you don't see a lot of white people protesting in South Africa, and and that's why I think the commentary is there, and and to a large degree that commentary is true, but simply because of the fact that, that white people will, will rather sort of stand at a robot with a placard and don't normally go, um, you know, go into the streets. But Joe, what I will say is this. What I don't like is I don't like protests that land up um, in nonsensical violence. So I, yes, I really, I I really don't like these protests um, that close businesses down and land up with yes. shops being smashed and looting and <laughs> public property being destroyed, that kind of thing. So, I, you know, there's a difference between public violence and, and protesting. And um, what I and aim to do... Terrorism. And terror, absolutely. And what I aim to do is I, I mentor a lot of uh, young leaders in the DA and having been a youth leader myself, I was very lucky to have had superb mentors. And one of the things I do is I, I teach my young leaders how to protest with respect and how that if they raise their argument, they don't have to raise their voice. And it's very hard to, to break down a good argument. So it's very easy to smash a window in, but it's very hard to smash a hard, fast argument. Um, mm. And uh, that, that, that's what I think that, that we need to learn in South Africa is we need to raise the level of our argument and we need to learn constructive ways in taking on our government. But the most important thing that South Africans need to learn is that the power still remains with the people of our country and the government serves at our pleasure. And your, your finest form of protest is the ballot box. 
And when South Africans learn that, that the power is in the X, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the cross, um, I think that, that that's the day that we've really achieved maturity as a democracy. Yes, I, I agree with you. I just, I fear for South Africa, but before I comment about the voting thing, I wanted to ask, because you say you'll be at uh, a lot of protests and marches. Yeah. Would you be at a Cape Secession march? No, I would not. <laughs> and I'll tell Sorry. you why. I have no, to I, ask. You have to ask, and that's, that's <laughs> absolutely okay. Look, I, I, I spend 90% of my time in Cape Town, and I, yeah. I do see how, how much better it is. And I'm going to proudly tell you that it is better because it's run by my party and mm -hmm. and we do a better job and we're not perfect. And by God, do we make mistakes? And when we make them, they are biblical. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, we govern a lot better. And I get why people would want the Cape to be a separate country. But too much has gone into the South African project to now cut a chunk of the country away and say, well, to hell with the rest of the country and to hell with the rest of this, these amazing people that are our fellow South Africans and, and let's, let's separate and let's call independence. I fight for all of South Africa. And I, I don't think that it's, it would be healthy to have a, an independent Western Cape. I think we should concentrate on making all of South Africa, um, you know, ra raise the level so that, that everyone feels that they, they they're proud to live in a South Africa, like people are, are proud to live in the in the Western Cape. And uh, what about because we've heard the DA speak about uh, federalism? Is that something yeah. you said? Said okay. Yes. Yeah, so look, we're a federal party, um, mm. and it's you know it's something that we practice in the party a lot. You know, so as Chief Whip, uh, my phone number and my email is available on the internet. Um, you know, which I don't always think is a, the greatest thing in the world, but, you know, at least, you know, you can always get hold of me. Um, yeah. But people will say, I, I'm having a problem in the, the Cape Town Metro Council, and they can't understand why I can't intervene. And I can't intervene because we are a federal party, and we separate the party from the state, and we separate the, the spheres of government. So I will refer you to someone in the Cape Town Metro who can help you, but I certainly won't step in and say, you know, try and pull rank because, you know, I, I strongly believe in federalism. So mm -hmm. look, there's talk, you know, and, and there has been talk, do we need nine provinces? Um, and are we gonna do away with provinces? And I'll tell you why that talk is happening. And that talk is happening because more and more the ANC is losing this, this majority power grip that they have over the country. So um, I think that we have a, you know, a healthy federal system. I think that cities, for example, should be given a little bit more power. Um, and I mean that literally and figuratively like the Western Cape, uh, you know, when the country goes into stage two or three load shedding, Cape Town can normally stay on stage one, or if we're I've on stage noticed, one, yeah. it doesn't have load shedding because it's it's starting to procure and, and buy it and generate its own power. And I think cities should have that kind of power. So what I want to see is I want to see less of a dependence on the state and more of a, I'm, I'm a big believer in a free market system. Um, yes. So I want to see less less of this this need for the state to be the employer of South Africa and for everything to depend on the state. But again, that that's taking time and it's it's taking a, a maturity of democracy for people to understand that state control goes way beyond just um, the, what, what gets said in Parliament. State control is when your electricity is monopolised. Um, when your, you know, more money goes into your airline than it does to procuring vaccines um, and things like that. So it's it's a whole, it's, it's something that we need to start teaching in schools. Um, and that's something that uh, I did. I did a stint in America for uh, the American Council of Young Political Leaders. And I was there in 2008. So what a time to be in the States and, and, and you know, what a time to see a, a shift in dynamic. And one thing that I was so impressed with was I was taken to a school in Chicago and I got there as, as they were teaching a, a political literacy class. And they were teaching kids the fundamental basics, for example, of how to vote so that you didn't spoil your ballot paper. So they taught these kids that you make the X, 
very clearly in the box and that you only make one X because if you do it anywhere else, the ballot is spoiled. And I just thought, you know, this is, it sounds so basic, but if you don't tell someone, how are they going to know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that uh, this whole idea of federalism is something we have to flesh out a little bit more in South Africa. Okay, interesting. I, it's, it's a tough one for me, if I'm honest. Look, I, I, I am American and I'm South African. I have both passports, I have dual citizenship. Um, and obviously American or America being uh, quite, you know, the federal uh, United States, uh, yeah. I think it to some degree works. I guess right now it's debatable. Um, <laughs> but um, having you said that, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I think, I, I don't know if it would work in South Africa. I do believe that South Africa has a very, very diverse amount of people, yeah. cultures, ethnic groups, so on and so forth. Maybe federal is the way to go. I don't know. Uh, however, I will say this, and um, I think everybody would agree there, because I'm seeing a lot of people asking me a question to ask you. Yeah. And uh, I, I, okay. Ask it, ask it. This is, this is, I told you, I'm an open book, yeah. and you, I don't get offended, ask me. All right. Uh, so a lot of people were asking earlier on, and some are still asking, why should they vote for the DA? Apparently, a lot of the, a lot of voters or DA has lost a ton of votes. I saw comments saying they've lost a, a lot of votes. Why do you even work with the DA? Why do you choose the DA? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Do you want to? Yeah, you're welcome to address that. Yeah. Look, I think the the, the you know I, I said it earlier that that we don't make. Um, a lot of mistakes, but when we make them, they're biblical. Yeah. And we we made a really big mistake in the 2019 election by not providing South Africa with a message that was easy to understand. We went into an election um, very unsure of ourselves, of who we were, of what we stood for, and were we still a, a liberal democratic party or, you know, holding the rational center? Or yeah. were we veering more to the left? Were we, some of us, you know, veering more to the right? Where, where were we? And I think that came across. And I, I, I went to public meetings where I had people legitimately stand up and say, you've just said something that completely contradicts what the leader of your party has said. And I knew that at times I was I was contradicting the leader of my party, but I stand by my my convictions. And and I, the, the one thing I, I can honestly say hand to heart is, is that I'm not a hypocrite. I, I, I say what I believe. And like I said to you earlier, not everyone will like what my beliefs are and not everyone should. But if, if you're a liberal and and you believe um, in you know the classic liberal philosophy, then you will agree with a lot of my politics, and um, you know you, you will you'll understand where I'm coming from. So we had this message: one South Africa for all, and that was our core message. Well, quite frankly, what does that mean? What does one South Africa for all actually mean? We are. I mean, I look at my family, and. I have Italian parents. I'm born in South Africa. I'm married to a, a South African man, uh, an English South African. My sister's married to an Afrikaans South African. Uh, my niece is going out with someone who is half Nigerian and half South African. I look at my group of friends. We could be the United Nations if, if one considers where everyone's parents are from. Um, and even, even my family was saying to me, but what do you mean one South Africa for all? Like, tell us how you're going to be one South Africa for all. And I think what we need to do, uh, and, and it was a lesson that we learned the hard way. We went into the election with 101 MPs uh, in total, uh, and uh, that included the National Council of Provinces, and we came out three MPs down. And that was... Um, but a hiding of, of note that our voters gave us. And it was sending us a clear message that we had to make it very clear who we were. And what we'd done is we'd lost our principled stance. 
So we went into a review process, which was ugly and dirty and nasty, as all review processes are. And I had to sit down and I had to hear some very difficult truths about me and where I had erred and what had really um, pissed a lot of voters off were things that I had done. And no one wants to hear that, that, you know, when you think you've done the right thing, that you've actually done the wrong thing. And you have to learn from those lessons. And I think that um, the, the way you judge your character isn't the way you fall, it's the way you pick yourself up. Yeah. And I, I listened to some very, very hard truths. I did some serious introspection. And I stood, my, I stood up and I dusted myself off. And I realized that I was a true liberal who was going to hold the rational center for South Africa. And that is why I chose to stay with the Democratic Alliance. Um, I'm not left wing. I'm not right wing. I'm, I believe myself to be a true centralist. And I had a kid from UCT who was um, goading me the other day and, and saying, but you're so classically right wing. And I, I thought, you know, bless you, bless you, because you don't realize that by this very goading, you yourself are acting uh, in a, a fashion that anyone who's right wing would absolutely love. But it's good to challenge and rage against the machine. And that's what my party does. My party rages against the machine. And um, I believe that, that we have the fundamental principles on which my party is based, uh, the, the core values that we stand for, uh, non-racialism, non-sexism, uh, the right to love who you want to love, uh, that we, are a, we believe in a, a meritocracy, um, I believe that we're on the right track and I believe that we are the party, we are the vehicle that can take South Africa forward. And I think that what we are going to see going forward is the need for this rational center to hold. And what you're seeing at the moment is the extreme left and the extreme right gaining popularity because whenever a country goes through a crisis period, which let's be honest, we're in, we're, we're, we're completely bankrupt. Uh, South Africans are terrified of COVID. We've seen the economy tank out because of COVID. People do tend to, to sort of naturally corral themselves into who they think their groupings are. And what we need to do as South Africans is understand that a grouping isn't the color of your skin or where your parents were originally from or what tribe you're, you, you're originally from or what province you're from. It's what your belief system is. And I, I can tell you that I, I deal with South Africans from all walks of life. 99% of South Africans all want the same thing. They want to live a good life. They want to live a safe life. They want a healthy life. They want a good education for their children. And they want dignity. And I believe that that's what my party can offer. I'm going to be honest, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of uh, political say, which, uh, you know, uh, obviously you're going to naturally, that's the answer yeah. or that's the attitude. But you didn't answer my question. I, I understand. OK, I understand. You answered the part of why you are with the DA, why you like the yeah. DA that that came across. OK, but I don't think people are convinced as to why they should now vote the DA. I mean, yes, you said all the right things that we, we believe in X, Y, and Z, and this is where we want to go and stuff. But here's something, and this is something that I, even I, I'm going to be honest with you now. Yeah. I've been battling with three parties, hmm. one of which is, is, is DA. Um, and I've been asking South Africans, a lot of South Africans, like, why won't they vote? Because like, some South Africans are very vocal about the DA, and like, I'll never vote for the DA. They lost my trust, blah, blah, blah. And then I ask why. What, what happened? So there's issues like, uh, you know, they, they mentioned that, you know, even though, yes, the DA runs the Western Cape better than other parts of, of the country. And even now I'm seeing that because I'm in Joburg. I've, I've noticed the potholes. I've noticed all this stuff. I know that the DA has a clean audit and all that. I know that stuff. But I feel that you guys are the opposition party and you have yet to really crap that whip. Um. You know, what you say, it's it's interesting because the only thing worse than losing an election is winning an election and, and governing badly. 
Mm. And we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe that we're the government in waiting or are we still stuck in this mindset that we are the official opposition? Well, so, let, me, let me also add to that. Let me, let you yeah. bring up a good point there because a lot of people are having the conversation, including myself, where we're just like, you know what, let's just vote DA to not waste a vote, to not, because you guys at the moment are the opposition, you're the biggest opposition there is, and we are so sick and tired of the ANC, we don't want another four or five years of the ANC, let's just vote DA, please, as a strategy, which, you know, when you think about it, you're winning by default, and yeah. is that something the DA really yeah. wants? It's not because, like I said, we're a meritocracy. We want to win because we're the best. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, here's the thing. We, we didn't communicate to you what we stood for. So <laughs> our poster, for example, said increase border control. Now, you know, as a child of immigrant parents, that to me actually sounded xenophobic. And I, you know... I felt very uncomfortable and I, I voiced my opinion, but I'll be honest with you, I didn't voice it loud enough because that poster still went up. What that poster should have said was, come through the gate, don't jump the fence. And then you would know what I was talking about. It would be a, a clearer message. So what I'm but saying to you- Well, let's clear that up because you mean yeah. basically come into the country legally legally absolutely yes. you know and, and the way we the, the way we put it it was like we didn't want anyone coming into the country and it was a confusing message mm. and i think that what happened was a lot of good people including myself were a little scared to voice our opinion because mm. we didn't know if if we were going to make it through if we voiced our our opinion loud enough and what we did is we eventually did stand up and we spoke up and we said it goes this far and no further. And we saw what happened. We lost a leader, we lost a mayor of Johannesburg, uh, and we lost a federal chairperson. And one of those hurt me. The other two, wish you luck as I wave you goodbye. But it's, it's a lesson in politics that was incredibly difficult to learn. But I'll tell you this, if, if anything, it's taught John Steenhuizen just exactly what kind of responsibility you have when you lead a party that is the government in waiting and wants to convince a nation that they're a government in waiting. And what John has done is he has taken the very best of his caucus and he's put them in the shadow cabinet. And there's no more pussyfooting around you know, making sort of reconciliatory, proudly South African speeches. We are now allowed to speak our mind. And I can tell you that because we had uh, voting agreements with the EFF in Johannesburg, for example, which I was just yeah. distraught about, and, and I, I kept my mouth shut when I should never have. I was Better, never allowed yes. to call the EFF a fascist. I now call them fascists as often and anywhere that I possibly can. I would scream it from the top of Table Mountain if I could. And that is the lesson that we learned the very hard way, was when we were taken into a situation where we were going to govern at any cost, it cost us our very principle. And that can never be allowed to happen again. So now, I mean, you know, we, we do have, you know, young people are, are naturally very rebellious. And that's great. Young people must be rebellious. Young people must rage against the machine. And naturally, I think a lot of young people all over the world veer towards the left. And the left is very appealing, right? And then they earn their first salary. Oh, yeah. And then they realize, hey, hey, hold on. This is this is quite this is this is this is an interesting phenomenon. And then when they see that huge chunk of tax coming off, they're like, hold on, I didn't sign up for this. And then when they see that huge chunk of tax giving them nothing in return, then they're even more angry. 
And that is that is what we we lost that as a party. We lost that fighting spirit. To uh, uh, the, we lost the the Helen Sussman. We lost the the that 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 rage, that outrage that we'd had, and people just didn't know who we were because how could we be this party who claimed to be to be the rational centre, but then to govern Johannesburg, we had a voting agreement with the EFF. That's outrageous, and people like me kept quiet. Well, I've learned my lesson. So if anyone's listening who thinks I didn't learn my lesson, believe you me, every day of my life, I'm thankful that I have a chance to make amends for that. And every day of my life, I make sure that I fight for that rational center and I will never allow anyone, be it in my party or in another party, to stop me talking truth to power. And that was the problem. We stopped talking truth to our own power. Well, if you want my honest opinion on what you just said, uh, you need to speak louder. Uh, I yeah. Think what I've noticed is uh, I think there are people out there that want to vote DA, but then they hear their friends speaking ill of the DA. And then they it's almost like that Trump thing, like yeah. silent the silent majority thing, you know? So there are people that will vote DA, but they're scared now to say that they're going to vote DA because their friends are going to ridicule them, you know? Um, I do think there's something like that happening in South Africa. I do believe that. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. Uh, I've heard about it. But I think that the DA would win a lot more votes and have a very big majority uh, if if you're if you finally took a bite instead of barking. And Absolutely. that's a question that I find a lot of people, even those that don't like the DA, um, saying. Like, yeah, they're all bark and no bite, all bark and no bite. And I find that I, I find that true. And sorry, before you comment on that, I, I've, I've missed on some super chats. And my fans are going to kill me. Uh, so, uh, Yanni, uh, and can I borrow you for another 10 minutes? If, if that's Yes, okay. of course. Okay. I'm yours. Um, course. I'm yours. Awesome. So Yanni says, uh, what is the risk of and is the DA scared of an ANC EFF coalition? Uh, so what is the risk of a, a ANC EFF coalition and are you guys scared of that? Uh, yeah, I think that's so, it. Um, the risk is, is it's there. It's, it's always been there. Um, look, you must remember that the EFF is birthed from the ANC. It's the, yes. the, it's the son who left, who left the, the home and it's the snake that turned on itself. And, mm. You know, we've gone from, you know, I, I really wanted to make one of those memes where how it started with pay back the money and yes. where we are now with um, Zoom at Tumblr. Like that to me was just the most outrageous thing I'd seen you know, for a long time. Yeah. So I don't think that there will be necessarily um, an alliance with the ANC. But what I think we might see and in fact, I'm quite sure we are going to see is a shift in dynamic in South African politics, where I think you might see an ANC breakaway happening that that join up with uh, the EFF, and even within the EFF, there are members that that might break away and and you know form a, form another political movement. And the more time uh, I spend uh, in this COVID crisis watching things on, on the social media platforms and watching things on, on the virtual platforms, the more I see this, this shift and this breakaway happening. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to bite when the wheels of justice turn slowly. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I go to the Cape Town Central Police Station so often to lay charges, I think I deserve my own desk there. <laughs> and uh, true. And, uh, you know, I, I famously got, you know, I, I've, I've been called the Karen of South Africa and I want to change. I want, I want the new name of the, of the complainer to be the Natasha. And <laughs> the, the great Natasha. thing is I don't, I don't ask to speak to the manager. I actually do get to speak to the manager. Yeah, and, you just uh, walk in and, and go straight to the manager. You don't ask. Straight, straight to him. And, and I did it. I did it uh, the other night to to our president. I spoke directly to him, and I I told him how much he'd let me down because even I had great hope in in who I thought was a, a level headed businessman, 
And I don't like seeing a president kowtow to, to factionalism. And what really upset me was when he said, I would rather be seen as a weak president of the country than oh, yeah. ever betrayed by ANC. Like, you, you, can't, you can't speak like that. And I'll tell you, if a leader of my party ever says that they would put being the leader of the DA ahead of the, the needs of South Africa, I would be the first one to call a motion of no confidence in them. But what does scare me is um, things like the expropriation of our compensation. I do think we're going to see the ANC and the EFF team up together to try and push things like that through because they don't, the, the, the two parties together don't see the consequence that that will have on the future economy. They see the short-term gain and they don't see the long-term consequence. So, um, I, have I disagree to laugh. with that. I think I, I think they do see the consequence. Well, I, I think they know what they're doing. Um, I, I, but, let me let me put yeah. it this way. I hope I hope that they don't see the long term consequence because if they do, I mean that means we we're dealing with with sociopaths, and and that that scares me even more. But I, I have to we say are. that I do to a large degree we are dealing with sociopaths. Yeah, we are. Um, but so I, I I've laid a lot of charges, um, and. People are saying to me, but you lay these charges and nothing ever happens. Well, you know, McKinsey paid back a billion and a half dollars because of a charge that I laid. Uh, we have an entire new ESCOM board because of a charge that I laid. We have the Zondo Commission because we uncovered state capture and we laid the charges. And yes, the Zondo Commission is taking a long time. But there is so much to uncover. And, you know, just today, Judge Zondo said to the Constitutional Court that the penalty for, for, for um, being in contravention of a court order should be a two-year sentence. I mean, these are things that as South Africans should buoy us. They should, they should make us really sort of hopeful of, of what could happen because people have literally got away with murder, especially in the COVID crisis. They have got away with murder because stealing COVID money has killed South Africans. So you're not only killing the economy, you're literally killing people because you're keeping healthcare from people. And- Not just that, but you've stolen money that, uh, you know, again, uh, you, instead of putting it into small businesses like you, like you promised, yeah. you, you haven't. And those small businesses have collapsed and therefore families, uh, thousands if not millions have lost their jobs, which means they either turn to crime or uh, suicide and and other horrible oh, things that happen. So so yeah, the, definitely they've 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 lost they've yeah. killed so, a lot of people. I'll so say. I am I am worried about the EFF and the ANC, yeah. but I am confident enough in um, South Africans mm -hmm. that South Africans are good enough, just generally in their character, to not give this immense power to the extreme left or the extreme right. I, I, I think that we've gone through too much and we've succeeded at too much for it to come to an end now in, in this particular manner. I refuse to believe that everything that we fought for comes to null when people turn to the extreme left or the extreme right. I, I just, I, I, have, I have too much faith in South Africans. I think I understand your, 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 your sentiment there. Um, you know, you want to believe in the system, so to speak, and and be take the noble route. But sometimes change requires, like we said at the beginning, or like you said, be the change you want to see. Hmm. And sometimes that change needs a harder bite. Well, Joe, if if you could tell me how to bite harder, because I stop listening I, to the ANC. Stop being scared of the ANC. Literally, show them the middle finger. Just stop. Just stop. Just I know it's the law, and I know there's things you have to put in place and stuff like that. But that's what people want. You know, I've heard a lot of politicians talk about listening to the people, but yeah. uh, John says it all the time. The DA is about listening to the people. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're listening close enough, if I'm honest. And I, I would love to tell John this myself. I want to vote for the DA. Yeah. I'm being and I haven't said this on my on my channel before. I want to vote for the DA, but nothing yet has told me or shown me 
even though you guys say the right things, absolutely you say the right now, forget about the past. Forget about yeah. what happened. Forget about how you were hurt. Forget about that stuff. Even now, when you say the right things, and you absolutely do, I just I, I hear people saying, "But we want more. We want we want a party that's going to stop, just stop listening to this tyrannical government that we currently have, and realize that, like you just said yourself, most of Africans just want to live a good life. They want to provide for their family. They want to have education. They want to they want to live. They want a free market." They want opportunities to work. They want all that stuff. And you guys can make that happen, but you're not pushing hard enough. And I, I, what that entails necessarily, I don't know. But what clearly what is happening now isn't working. Joe, so whatever that might be, yeah. You know, earlier you said to me that you don't tear up a president's speech. Yeah. If I show the middle finger to the ANC... I have to figuratively tear up a president's speech. So that's what I've got to do. So I need you to go and listen to what I said to the president on Tuesday night. Okay. I need you to go and listen, and I need you to hear when I said to him, you are a fake, you are a fraud, you have let me down, you have let South Africa down, and you are not the president that you said you would be. Short of, I mean, I, there is literally with, within the, and, and you know, I believe in the rule of law. And I think that the day the DA becomes lawless, then I think we're in, we're in deep doo-doo. Like um, we, we do things in the, in, 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 the, in, in, in the way the law prescribes and we respect the judiciary. And, at the moment, the our problem, judiciary is... Yeah, but is the, problem, the problem with that, Natasha, is that uh, the ANC doesn't listen to law. You're fighting against someone who doesn't... It's like going into a fight that you know that person fights dirty. You know they fight dirty. Like, they, yes. they openly fight dirty. You know this. It's what they're known mm -hmm. for. So you either develop tactics that defend you from the dirtiness. Yeah. Or you fight dirty yourself. It's the only way. It's, it's, yeah. it's, I know it sounds horrible. And mm -hmm. I know, and I agree with you. I don't, I don't want necessarily. Like, if, if definitely think they're above the law. You yeah. know, they go around, they protest, they get away with a lot. You know, Julius Malema openly, openly incites hate speech all the time, blah blah blah. But I think there's a method in the which way. In the, it, sorry, I think there's a method that the DA could use that would be different to the mm -hmm. e, ANC and EFF. And I don't know. Again, I'm just a flipping comedian that has a YouTube channel. That does nothing but watch politics now and make fun of you guys. But I mean, I'm still a I'm still a citizen here, and I still yeah. care very deeply for South Africa. And like I said, I want to vote the DA. I just words are nice, Natasha, and I, I commend you very much for standing up to the president and telling that telling him that to his face. Well done, well done, absolutely well done. But I think actions speak louder than words. And again, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But I, I'm just letting you know what the people are feeling. Absolutely. And maybe you guys, the DA needs to have a meeting and say, hey, I just listened to a crazy comedian on YouTube. This is what he said. What do we think? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't so know. Let, me, let me tell you something. I, I've said, I said it at the beginning. Our, our yeah. messaging and the way we, we, we put our message across, we've got very wrong. And mm. we are, there's, there's a fundamental shift that's happening in the party. And I think you're going to like, especially as we go into the election phase, you're going to like what you see rolling out. But right. I look forward to it. one of the one of the, the the methods that we haven't used is this method. You said to me you couldn't believe that I I accepted your invitation. I couldn't believe that you invited me on your show. I was so awesomely chuffed that you had wanted me on your show, because one of the ways I change people's perception of me is for people to get to know me. So it's no good that you turn on channel 408 on TV and you see me in parliament. You need to see me in public meetings. You need to see yeah. me on YouTube channels, having frank discussions. You need mm. to see me talking to people who have very different approaches to politics. And you need to hear me arguing my side of the story and then decide if I have earned your vote or not. And we haven't done that enough. 
So this kind of conversation that. that we have having now, we need to have a million more of these conversations because, you know, and I, I love this, by Joe, I'm going to win your vote. And <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I, will, I will win your vote by arguing with you about politics until the point where you say that argument holds water with me. I believe that you can do that. And that's what I stand for too. But it means that I need to have one-on-ones and I need to get out onto the streets and I need to get out of that ivory tower that we sit in and we need to get down to bries, barbecues, um, just, you know, where people are hanging out and chatting to people and letting them know this is who I really am. This is what I will do if you vote for me. And, and you know, breaking this, breaking the stigma that is around all of us. Um, someone the other day on, on, on Twitter called me a racist and I didn't answer. And someone said, well, why aren't you defending yourself? So I said, well, why, why should I even try and defend myself? Because I'm not a racist, so I don't have to defend that. But the thing is, someone will read that and will believe it because he's never met me uh, or she has never spoken to me. The only thing she's ever seen is the complaining car in, in, car, in Parliament, you know, uh, blabbing my mouth in, in Parliament. That person needs to meet Tasha and needs to understand what Tasha believes and what Tasha stands for. And if it means that I have to travel every square inch of this country, that's what I'm going to do. And that's a direct order from the boss. And I might be the chief whip, but I get appointed by the leader. So when the leader says to me, you go around the country and you let people know what we stand for, that is what we are going to do. And we are going to make sure that South Africans understand what the DA stands for. And most importantly, who we are. I applaud that. I really do. I will hold you accountable because this, this is now alive. Yes. It's been said on YouTube. Absolutely. And I really hope I'll see you on a lot more interviews on the YouTube sphere, on the ground. Um, I think that's exactly what a politician should do is, is be part of the people for the people. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's perfect. I won't, uh, I do want to say one more or sorry, I want to bring up one thing that was said by Ramon Kabanek from Morning Shot. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, where is Joe and how did this hard arse interviewer replace him? <laughs> I didn't know. Am I being a hard arse? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? Is that Roman? Yeah, that's Roman. Yeah, that's Roman. Right. Good one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly yeah. enjoy uh, Ro You know, sometimes I'm having a bad day, and then I read I read Kevin X tweets, and then I my my day's been made. So, hello, Roman. I'm, I'm glad you're yeah. watching. When are yeah. you interviewing me? You've never yeah, been on. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, he also cool. gave it. He what also gave another super chat saying, hi, Natasha. My conspiracy is that the ANC may break up and the DA will form a coalition with the pragmatic side along with uh, uh, FF Plus uh, and other parties. Any thoughts on that? And I'll leave this as the last question before you go. I think Roman Kabanek should have me on his show and I think he should ask me that question directly. Oh, snap. Okay, so we're leaving a bit of a cliffhanger. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Roman, if you're still watching... Uh, please get in contact with Natasha. Um, otherwise, I'll send. I have Roman's number, so I'll just get you guys in contact. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, I would definitely like to see you on Roman's show. I think that's going to be great. Uh, he's, I tell, he's I'll awesome tell you what, Joe. I, I will ask one favor. I, um, you know, I, I don't come on a show if I, if I don't research you very well. So you researched me, and I researched you. I want you to invite me for a roast, and I think. Uh, <laughs> Um, you you choose you choose who roasts me, and you let me roast back, and then and then we'll decide who wins the roast. Wait, are are do you, do you, wait? Okay, so is this like comedians roasting you, or do you want fellow politicians roasting you? No, I want I want the real people. I want comedians roasting me. You know, I, I want oh, I want. Oh boy, because that's I don't that's think you know what you've opened yourself up to. <laughs> that is so my game because. Let me tell you, you're going to see a politician with a skin like a rhino. And um, one thing I will say is to be a politician, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. And yes. 
my oh my i know i know my flaws and i know the tweets that i've that i've put out that have been like dramatically misinterpreted and wrong and um i laugh at myself so i would love uh, for other South Africans to laugh with me, because I think you'll see a, a, a humorous side that that also uh, it makes it makes me more of a, a human being. And I think that we need to understand that we might be politicians, and I'm a politician, you're a comedian, but at the end of the day, we we're, we're both human beings, and we there, there's a lot more that that holds us in common that then keeps us apart. And one of those things is humor. Absolutely. Um, uh, Yanni, I think, is very excited about that. I think it's Yanni. Yanni's loving that. Eh? Yanni's in. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're serious, I'll make it happen. I'll, I'll, I'll ask around with some of the comedians, but then the viewers have to do me a favor. This video needs, or this interview needs to be shared everywhere. And if we can get this video to 50 likes, which is not hard, then I will organize uh, a roast with uh, the roast of Natasha Mazan, which I think will be absolutely brilliant and uh yeah i think uh will be a, a testament to your promise to be part of the people and show inside and i mean i'm the, in the roast i'm even going to teach you to pronounce my surname sorry how do you pronounce it you know when you say pizza it's a double z pizza? which makes a t sound so matsone uh, is just like pizza the double the double z makes a t sound matsone so Mat so just think pizza matsone okay. Pizza Mazzone. Yeah. I know, um, I know, uh, what's, uh, Pizza de Merda. Oh, no. <laughs> you won't, you won't get that for me. Yeah, but, I know. Uh, you'll get it from a lot of my colleagues that sit to the left of me and right. All right. Well, I'm going to cut it here. Uh, Natasha, once again, you know what? It was a pleasure. Uh, having you on the show, I would love to have you back uh, maybe in a few months' time. Thanks. Maybe when you've, uh, you know, cocked out the EFF and I can get that rage on the show. Anytime you want to cuck out the EFF on my show, know that you have uh, freedom of speech on this show and you can say whatever you want about them. It will be greatly welcomed. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, so but revolutionary fascist thugs. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed, one hundred percent. All right. So uh, once again, Natasha, thank you so much for thank for tuning in. Okay, so um, I'm going to end off the show, uh, but if you want to, you can you can hang around, uh, and then I'll chat to you once I'm done. Or if you have to go, I understand you can you can just log off. Uh, but Thanks. but once again, uh, thank you so much, and I will be in contact with you to see I what happens next. To it. Okay. All right. Take your care. Cheers. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Nat Natasha Mazzone. Mazzone? Mazzone? Mazzone. Sorry, I probably messed that up again. Uh, but thank you all so much for tuning in. Please share this far and wide. Remember, get us to 50 likes, and we'll have the roast of Natasha Mazzone. Um, I would very much like to hear that. I see a lot of you saying nice, uh, nice interview, best interview ever. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. Thank you all. For the uh, super chats, uh, Ramon, Yanni, and, and and Chris White, thank you all so much for the super chats. Greatly appreciated. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. And maybe one day I'll have uh, John Steenhuisen on the show. And I'll, I'm not, as you guys saw today, I was not afraid to to push back a bit. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys once again for tuning in. Thank you guys for watching. Please share. Please like. And don't forget to go check out Rebel. And I'll remind you guys that if you support my channel, go to my website. The link is in the description. It says support me monthly. Go to that link, sign up, become a member for as little as 40 rand a month. That's it, 40 rand. After six months, you get to choose a rebel hat of your choosing, all right? And you might be able to get this one. Well, you, you will be able to get this one if you're so inclined. I know Natasha wants one, so we'll see if we can get her one. All right, other than that, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to like and subscribe. And there's other ways that you can donate to my channel if you would like to. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will be back when am I back? Tomorrow. I'm back tomorrow evening with a Tech Tuesday show. Please tune into that. And uh, if I don't see you there, stay safe, be kind to one another, and I'll see you at the next one. Cheers. <laughs>